Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Sunday Morning Bible Study for June 19th, 2011. This morning, Pastor Bob Hiller continues our discussion on baptism based on chapter 17 in the Lutheranism 101 book. Let's listen in. Uh, let's start with the word of prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for this day. We thank you for the gift of baptism. And as we discuss in the sermon, the Great Commission, we pray that you would remind us of the wonderful gift of baptism. And we pray that you would... Uh, be with us in this study this morning. Uh, help us to understand your word properly and faithfully. May you be glorified among us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so a reading here this morning from uh, a book called Follow Me, Discipleship According to the Gospel of Matthew. According to St. Matthew, I should say. Um, this is what it says. Uh, For baptism is a washing in the name of... That phrase was no mystery for men of Palestine, but spoken plainly. Like we always say, we baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And what does that actually mean? This is a helpful beginning, I think, for us this morning. Uh, They knew that a sacrifice performed in the name of God was a sacrifice intended for God, committed to him. They knew that a Gentile circumcised in the name of the proselyte thereby became the proselyte. That is someone who's being converted. They knew that such a circumcision performed in the name of the covenant brought a man into the covenant, made him a partaker of its blessings, and put him under its obligations. Baptism in the name of meant for Palestinian ears an effectual committal, a determinative consignment to the thing or person named in the formula. Baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit meant, therefore, that the person baptized was being committed to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was being effectually committed to the God whom Jesus has revealed as Father, the Father of the limitless, spontaneous love, the fathers who will, uh, the fathers who, the Father whose will is that He reign in royal grace over all men, the Father that seeking Shepherd of the lost, whose will it is that no one of the little ones who believe in Jesus shall perish, the Father who gave the cup which man's sin, uh, sin had mixed the Son. Boy, oh boy, this is harder to read than I thought. The Father who gave the cup which man's sin had mixed to the Son, whom the Father's love made servant for mankind. The baptism which Jesus commanded committed a man to that mercy as it consigned him to the life-creating, life-sustaining ministrations of that Spirit who had descended upon Jesus when he began his servant ministry. The Spirit who led Jesus to triumph over Satan. The Spirit in whose might he stripped the strong man bound and ushered in the kingdom of God. Baptism is the whole eschatological or fulfillment, fulfilling gift of the redeeming God concentrated in an act. I don't know if any of that made sense, but that's a pretty good way of thinking about things, that baptism in the name of uh, means that you are being committed to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We might even turn that on its head and say the the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is committing himself to you. Uh, You belong to him and He is yours and you are his and all of that. So uh, kind of a good way for us to start today as we think about baptism. Uh, So that's what we're going to do today again. Finish up our talk about baptism. Any thoughts on our discussion from last week? Any thoughts from your reading this week? Uh, Anything? Yeah. Shut this door here. No? Yeah. Nothing? No questions about baptism? Yeah, what was covered last week? <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll see. How that. I don't work there. So we got into a little bit last week about uh, what baptism is. Um, we kind of talked more about law and gospel last week, so we'll kind of redo a, a little bit of it today. Um, but what we're going to do, I think, this morning is I'm going to lay out for you uh, what the Bible actually teaches about baptism. You're all going to look up a whole bunch of verse, verses, and then we're going to compare what the Bible is saying to a lot of common views on baptism, uh, and uh, we'll see where we end up from there. Um, last week, I watched the video because I want to see how the teaching is going in all of this, and I saw that I will announce that we're going to do things that day, and then we never get to them. So today what we're actually going to do here is we are going to read the verses, 
and I analyze them in light of other views on baptism. My hope is that we actually do these things this morning. So, um, can you guys look up verses for me today? Thank you. Can someone look up Mark 16, 16? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Acts chapter 2, 37 through 41. Thank you. Romans 6, 1 through 11. Thank you, Garrett. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Jeff, thank you. Galatians 23, uh, excuse me, Galatians 3, 23 through 29. Thank you, Nancy. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Anybody? Bang. All right, Carol, go for it. Eve, can you look up Colossians 2, 8 through 15? 8 through 15? Yes. And then um, two more. Do we have anyone who's able to look up any more? Frosty, can you look up Titus 3, 4 through 7? And then one more. Do another one, all right. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. Okay, so there are many views on baptism. Uh, the Lutheran view is the right one, of course. That's why we're here. <laughs> okay, that's not fair. Uh, but uh, there are a number of views on baptism, okay? And so what we want to do today is discuss some of those views and look at them in light of the texts. So um, let's just look at these real briefly, and then we'll talk about it. The Roman Catholic system, the Roman Catholic teaching says that baptism uh, washes away original sin uh, and then brings you into the life of salvation. That is to say, you are now brought into the sacramental system. So you're, you're kind of brought in and you're filled with grace, as we've talked about before. You're filled up with grace at baptism. Original sin is washed away. Uh, but then, once you start sinning, you start to lose the grace of baptism. All right? Uh, so you need to continually be taking part in the sacraments so that you don't lose grace altogether. So baptism fills you up with grace, okay? Washes away original sin. That's the Roman Catholic view. The Calvinist view, uh, this is many Reformed churches, uh, Calvinists, oh boy, Presbyterian is probably going to hold this view. Some Anglican churches may hold this view, though you never know with an Anglican, but they're, they're probably going to hold this view. Um, Episcopal churches. Um, this is the view that baptism has replaced circumcision. In other words, baptism is a mark of the new covenant. Okay. Uh, so uh, in the old covenant, how did you know you were part of the covenant? Circumcised, right? In the new covenant, it's baptism. And that's basically it. Uh, it makes you a part of the family of God, though it does not save you. It just makes you a member of the outward visible church. Okay, that's what the Calvinist view is. Uh, the Baptist view, uh, so therefore Calvinists and Catholics will both baptize babies. Good Calvinists, who actually follow what Calvin teaches, uh, are, are going to say that you should baptize babies. You should do that. Because just as children in the Old Covenant were included, children in the New Covenant are included as well. Okay. Uh, Baptists are going to say, and this is sort of your non-denominational, evangelical, uh, sort of across the board, pretty much American Christianity, uh, is going to say that uh, baptism should be done only to adults because baptism is an outward confession of an inner change. Does that make sense? So you are saying out loud what has happened to you on the inside. You are confessing what has happened in your heart. Okay, so the Holy Spirit has saved you, the Holy Spirit has changed you, and now you're just going through this ceremony as a way of proclaiming to the world that I have been saved. It does nothing other than that. It literally does nothing. Now you do it, you have to do it, because Jesus said so. But all it is is a symbolic act of what's happened inside of you. So that's the Baptist view. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, finally... Uh, then you have the Lutheran view. And we're going to say baptism kills the old Adam, raises us to a new life, forgives our sins, uh, gives us eternity and all the promises of Jesus. 
we're going to put a lot into baptism. We're going to talk in terms of something called <laughs> baptismal. <coughs> Regeneration. <laughs> Baptismal regeneration. Baptism regenerates you. It resurrects you. It saves you. All right, that's what Lutherans are going to say. Now, this is going to sound awfully tricky, especially since Lutherans are also going to say you're saved how? By faith. By grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ alone, right? So how does that fit with baptism? Does that work? Are we saying that a ceremony saves us? No. no. Not exactly. Is baptism a ceremony? Well, I guess we do it. We pour water on someone. We say lots of prayers and stuff around them. But the idea here is this. is not so much, this is what we talked about last week. So here's the review. Baptism is whose work? God. God's. God's work. So the Baptist, you say to a Baptist, baptism saves you, and they're going to say, well, how can you possibly say that? Our works don't save us. And we'll say, yes, you're right. But baptism is not our work. It's the work of God. Christ is at work saving us in the waters of baptism. So faith is still in Christ, faith in the Christ who is baptizing us. Faith in the Christ who has incarnated uh, was incarnate, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and all those things. Faith in that Jesus who is doing the baptizing. So of course baptism can save us because Jesus is the one who's working salvation in the baptism. See, It's not our work, though he uses human hands as instruments. It's still his work. Where do we get this? From the Bible. Okay? So let's go to it. Mark 16, 16. Well, first... Luther's going to talk this way, and this is very helpful. Uh, <coughs> baptism is both given to us as a command and as a promise. So we have to do it. It's kind of, in a sense, law and gospel in, in this way. It's both given as a command and a promise. Where does he command it? Like we have to do it? Well, yes, that's right. That's exactly right. We have to do it because Jesus says, so. do it. You sort of listen to what Jesus says. Yeah, but where in the Bible does he say that? Commission. Great commission. Oh, so I went to church this morning and was able to listen. That's terrific. Sometimes the kids don't allow for that. Uh, yeah. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing. So do we have to do it? Yeah. Now, incidentally, when we say all nations, who is excluded? Would you include babies in all nations? I would. Yeah. They're part of nations. <laughs> They're people, as it turns out, sinful ones at that. Uh, so yes, uh, they need to be baptized. Even you, you cute little man. <laughs> Are you sure, Dad? All right. Mark tried to grab the communion wafers this morning. He went and he got the tray. He wasn't going to let go. Not a single one spilled. Good job. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's right. So uh, we're commanded in the Great Commission to baptize. At that point, uh, one guy I was watching out a video this week made an interesting point that the Great Commission in the early church was not called the Great Commission, but it was called the Great Institution because it's there where Jesus institutes both the uh, 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 institutes baptism and institutes uh, the, the ministry, uh, teaching of the word. Um, so uh, we look at it as a great place of instituting something. God institutes baptism in the Great Commission. So we have to do it. But what does baptism accomplish? Who's got Mark 16, 16? Go for it, Jeff. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. What's the next part? But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Okay. So uh, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. That's pretty straightforward. That's what Jesus says. Is baptism included in salvation? Yes. According to Jesus, it is. Uh, now, Luther says this, To be saved, as everyone well knows, is nothing else than to be delivered from sin, death, and the devil, to enter into Christ's kingdom, and to live with him forever. <laughs> in other words, Luther's saying, that's what's delivered to you in baptism. Now, if you have a Baptist friend, or you've ever been a Baptist, or you're thinking about becoming a Baptist, you hear these verses, and here's what you say. Look, the main thing here is belief. The baptism is not that big of a deal. Because what is the next part? Whoever, do, whoever does not believe 
will be condemned. So the whole thing is about belief. And we're going to say, well, sure, but Jesus includes baptism. It's belief and baptism together. It's not one versus the other. One's not incidental to the conversation. Well, then why doesn't it say he who doesn't believe and who isn't baptized won't be saved? Because it's just sort of assumed that if you don't believe, you haven't been baptized. Uh, because uh, there's not a single New Testament Christian who has not undergone baptism. Look at it. Find one Christian in the New Testament who hasn't been baptized. Unbelievers don't get baptized. So Jesus doesn't have to say whoever does not believe uh, and is not baptized won't be saved. Except it would be redundant. Except the thief on the cross. Sure, but the thief on the cross is, is remarkably exceptional in that he didn't need baptism since Jesus was hanging right next to him, right? I mean, there's sort of something we don't have that the, the thief had. He's, one guy said it this way, uh, he sort of has the sacrament of all sacraments, Jesus on the cross. Yeah, he doesn't need baptism in that sense. And we also don't want to say this. The, the th this is a good point to bring up, Chris. The thief on the cross is not a good model for how to be saved. <laughs> right? This is not the example of the Christian life for us. Because people will always run there, well, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. No. <laughs> but it's a good example of God's mercy. Uh, sure. Well, of course. And I'm not, I'm not yeah. denying that at all. But so is baptism. Yeah. And we don't ever... See, what happens in these conversations is people want to pit the thief on the cross against baptism. And I, don't, I, never, I never understand that. They're not working against each other. Thief on the cross was saved because Jesus told him so. When you were baptized, Jesus told you you were saved. For the thief on the cross, it was while he was hanging next to Jesus. For you, it's when water hits your head or you're immersed or whatever. Um, it, they're not working against each other. They're just two different ways Jesus saves people. Okay? If you're ever crucified next to Jesus, maybe he'll say the same thing to you. Um, but in these moments, we don't have that. We have baptism. So it's a good example to bring up and it's important to bring up, but the thief on the cross is not the model of the New Testament Christian. And we can't undo all the baptism verses uh, because of the thief on the cross. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. Cool. So um, if you don't believe and are baptized, then that doesn't count either. No, because baptism doesn't work apart from faith. Um, it's not like baptism is this golden ticket. See, this is Rome's problem. Rome says, baptism saves you. Oh, Jeff, you brought up some Latin. Baptism saves you. Ex opera. Not opera. Op opera. Operata. I think that's the Latin. Ex opera operata. By virtue of the act itself. So Rome is going to say, if you've been baptized, you're just in. Right away, right there, when the water hits your head, faith doesn't matter at all. Just because you underwent the ceremony, the ceremony itself saves you. It's not the promise, it's the ceremony. And if there's no faith, well, that, well, whatever. That, that's, faith is not part of the conversation there. It's the ceremony that counts. Go ahead. Uh, that kind of got me kind of confused. What about the whole, like, sinning and all that for the Roman? So, like, even if you spend, like, your whole life sinning, but you were baptized for the Romans, you're automatically in? For the Catholics. Um, well, no, no. Because here's what a Catholic will say. Uh, you've been saved. You've been filled up. Let's say that this is Garrett. Garrett, you're a cup, okay? Yeah. When you're baptized, you're filled up with this grace. This is like grace right here. It's like water poured in, okay? okay? And you start living your life, and you're doing pretty good, but suddenly you sin. And your grace becomes less. And you sin some more, and it becomes less. And suddenly you have less grace. And you're not so saved anymore. And so baptism doesn't work for you so much now. What you need is to go back into the sacramental system and start doing confession and make sure you're confessing rightly and then doing penance. And then you can be filled up with grace or your grace can go away. But Rome does not teach that just because you're baptized, you're automatically in. They would say you can lose that salvation. Which we would say too, but for a different reason. What was the question? Uh, he says, for the Catholics, would they say that once you're baptized, you can just go and do whatever you want and you're automatically saved no matter what? Like you can be baptized as a baby and then become like a mass murderer and still be in? But basically that's what they say. Uh, well, they say you can do that, but you, you go and make your confessions and you... Sure, well, right. So that was what I just said here. So that... Okay. Um, once, you're, once you start sinning, you go and make your confession to kind of work it off, and then you get that grace back. 
but you most certainly can lose your salvation and be consigned to hell if you get rid of all your baptismal grace and never earn it back. See, their system is not grace at all. It's, it's works. So uh, just because you go through the ceremony, so for a Catholic, you want to say, why don't you just take a hose out? <laughs> say the magic words over the water and start spraying people. I mean, you got to wonder about that. Now they're going to say that's obviously not wise and everything, but you run their system through that almost might work. Probably going to get an angry email from a Catholic about that one. But um, it, they say it saves ex opera operato just by the mere doing of the act. It saves you. Faith plays no part. Is okay? that why they, in their service, they... No, and actually, I really like that ceremony, incidentally. I kind of wish we would do it here, but you people get all upset about getting wet clothes. Uh, but you take it, all you're doing there is reminding people that they're baptized. Oh, is that what yeah, I really like that. I wish we could do that sometime where you, you have this... Uh, I don't know what you take. You like douse the people with You water. douse people with water, yeah. You take something, you <laughs> dip it in water, and you flick it all over the place to remind people that they've been baptized. Yeah. And everyone laughs, and it's kind of funny, but it shouldn't it be? Shouldn't it be, like, joyful to be remembered that, you're being baptized, that you've been baptized, that the water has, has saved you through Christ, has saved you through the water? I mean, that's kind of a fun thing, but all right. So, uh, good. Any more on that? We're doing good here? Okay. Baptism saves you. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. All right. Um, Jeff, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Acts 2, 37 through 41. Who's got that one? Oh, I do. All right. Uh, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Okay. With, oh, go ahead. Uh, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt uh, generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Okay. So... What does baptism do in this text? Peter says what? What must we do to be saved? And what does Peter say? Or what must we do? They don't say to be Repent saved. Repent and be baptized. Why? Receive forgiveness of For sins. the forgiveness of your sins. Here again, baptism and forgiveness are united together. There it is. The promise is for who? Everyone. Well, what's the text say? Let's be very clear. You and your children. You and your children? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Does the Bible say that the promises of baptism are for kids? Yeah, I guess so. Now, the argument against this is going to be that, and there's actually something to this, that when it says the promises for you and your children, the promise of, uh, they're going to say not baptism, but the promise of salvation is for you and the subsequent generations to come after you. He's sort of re repeating the Old Testament covenant that says, make sure you bring your children up in this continue to train your children up in these ways. But remember, in the Old Testament covenant, infants were included in that. So the promise is for you and your children, your infant children even, and uh, all the nations. Everyone's included here. But the promise of what? Forgiveness. Where is that found? In baptism. Be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. That's what it says. All right? Next, Romans 6, 1 through 11. Go. What, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may in, sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died, to, we died to sin. How can we live it, in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Je uh, Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with, with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him 
so that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ has, was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin to sin once for all, but the lives, the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is just an amazing text, okay? Um, in Romans chapter 5, Paul has just finished saying that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And everybody who hears that, their immediate response, and this is our response too, is maybe we should just keep sinning so we get more grace, right? I've said this before and stealing it from another guy. I like to sin. God likes to forgive. We got a great relationship, right? This is not exactly what we're called to. So the question becomes, all right, so if, if we're not to be sinning anymore, if grace is not an excuse to sin, how should we handle the sin in our lives? Our knee-jerk response is to say, well, Here's the rules, here's how to live, and we start giving more laws and more rules about how to live our lives, only making sin worse and worse and worse. Paul does not go to the law. He goes to the gospel. He goes to baptism. So, so uh, uh, what does it say? Uh, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? No, 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 Paul says. You've died to sin. Sin is a slavery. And you've been set free from that slavery. Your sinful nature has been killed. It has been crucified with Christ, and you have been raised to a new, sin-free, bondage-free life. Well, where did that happen? Baptism. Baptism united you with Jesus. It crucified you with Christ and raised you to a new life with him. This is why many churches, and there's a reason we don't do this, and I, I don't always like the reason, but whatever, uh, many churches, when they baptize, how do they do it? They immerse the baby or they immerse the person completely underwater because it shows you're buried and raised to a new life. Luther would say this way, you're drowning the old Adam and raised up to a new life in Jesus Christ. I like that. That's good. In fact, even in our large catechism, Luther writes, this is why we immerse children. Now, why don't we immerse children anymore? Or anybody? Not because we're going to kill them, because we're not going to kill them. All right. <laughs> A little impractical I would, on our surfaces. Yeah, well, we don't have a tub in here. Tech. Yeah, well, and actually, that, there's something to that. There were people, many of the Catholics were baptizing by just pouring water, just pouring water, sprinkling water on the head. And the Anabaptists, the rebaptizers is what that means, they came along during the Reformation and they said, it doesn't count. Baptism means immersion, and you need to be fully underwater if it has to be, if you want it to be a true baptism. Now, what's ironic about this is that the Anabaptists and modern Baptists today, very different, but they're the same here, uh, they're going to tell you, you must be immersed for, it to be, for that baptism to count. But then they're going to say, but baptism doesn't really do anything. So, okay. Uh, but, but what they're going to say is, see, it's, baptism means immersion. Well, it doesn't. It means washing with water is, is what it means. Um, and in the Bible, they're going to say, but everyone who's baptized was immersed, so you must be underwater. So they're going to become legalists about it. And so the Lutherans said, the amount of water doesn't matter. I mean, we don't actually have the gallons and how much water was in the river. I mean, if we're going to follow this way of thinking, we need to go to a river to be baptized. We must be in some brook somewhere. And if that's the case, what if there's not a wa enough water in the brook for us to be immersed? What if we can't have enough for an immersion? Will we not get to be baptized? They just start making up too many rules. So we say water's all that matters. As long as you got some water and the word, because the big thing is the word and the water, the promise, not how much water is involved. So we'll say as long as water's involved, you're good. Does that make sense? All right. Um, but I, I love this language of Romans. What does baptism do? It kills the sinful nature and it raises you to a new life. It crucifies you with Jesus. It unites you to Christ. You have died with him. You are now alive with him forever. That is your situation. That is who you are. Dead to sin and alive to Christ. 
So should we go on sinning that grace may abound? Why would we want to go back to slavery? Why would we want to do that? We've been set free from that. Pretty cool stuff. Good picture. Make sense? Tracking with me? Okay. Okay. Just a thought, you know, going back to that first verse on Mark, you know, when you're talking about infant, whoever believes in is baptized, yeah. okay? So we, we baptize an infant. Yeah. Now, at that point, they don't, are you saying that they believe? Yeah, I am. They have faith. Yeah, I can't, I mean, how can a child believe? I don't know. I just don't know. But. And when I was baptized as an infant, I can I had no recollection of believing yeah. at that point. Yeah, you? so you have to kind of believe the promise that it happened to you. I got pictures, so I know it happened. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've got, yeah. But who, so here's, here's what you're asking. Here's behind your question. Don't I have to contribute something? Don't I have to experience it? Don't I have to know it? Actually, this is why infant baptism is such a marvelous picture of grace. The baby did squat. Right. The baby did nothing. Right. And that is exactly where God needs us if he's going to save us. Um, I think it's the best possible picture of grace, that God would put grace on a baby who can't do anything but poop its pants. Um, would they do that? Don't laugh. It's true. And it's not funny. Um, and in fact, Jesus says this, unless you have faith like a little child, translation in Greek, infant baby, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So is Jesus saying that infant babies have faith? Apparently. Now, the argument goes, well, Jesus is using an illustration right there. Yes, he is using an illustration right there. He's using a baby's ability to trust in something as an example of what our trust in God needs to be like. Does Mark have the ability to trust in Stephanie right now? Absolutely. Does he realize it? No. He has no conscious ability of it. But he certainly knows that he relies on Stephanie for food and all of this sort of thing. It's what happens to us in baptism. We're dependent entirely on God, whether we're infants or adults. Now, we would say that in baptism, uh, faith is generated, baptismal regeneration, through the word and through the water, whether the baby knows it or not. It's not the point. The point is the promise. And God promises to save us in baptism. So we're trusting the promise you know, there. So you could almost say, you could almost theorize from that point on, we re, 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 regress because we, 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 as we grow, we grow, our human brain develops, we wow. study, we do all these things. All we do is be, rely on, on, on our own humanness. Man, you are so right. It's really true. <laughs> to I, some degree. I think I, there's something to it. Um, that's why, like we said in the sermon this morning, uh, that quote from uh, Will Willeman, the United Methodist pastor, the entire Christian life is learning what it means to be baptized. Mm-hmm. learning what it means to not depend on ourselves, right. but to be solely at the mercy of God. Um, and it's a good place to be at. Um, but yeah, I, that's absolutely, that's the hang-up with this. Well, babies can't have faith. Well, who said? Jesus says the baby's faith is the example for the rest of us because they're incapable of doing anything and wholly dependent upon somebody else. That's what faith is. Now, as we grow up, faith is that, we is included in faith is knowing and believing, but faith is ultimately a receiving and a uh, trusting before it is a conscious assent. I think is how I would say that. Um, so yeah, faith is not just sort of checking the box off and saying yes, I believe this, right? It's a dependency. It's a dependent relationship, which receives. But that 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 whole concept is so foreign to the world because we all want we all want to answer we want, we want to be in control yeah that's right that's we can't. I, I think Jeff I love when you talk because like, you just <laughs> you just nail it because this is exactly the problem people have with baptism yeah. the, the idea of baptism saving us is the exact problem that people ultimately have with grace right. is that we want to be in control we want to have some say in it We want to be in charge of our own lives, so we eat from the tree. That's really where this goes. We want to have some say in what happens to us, and we don't want God to be God over us, because we cannot believe that he's going to be good to us. We just don't. If we really believed God was going to be good to us, we would have no problem with saying we have no free will. As soon as I say we have no free will, everyone freaks out. It's like, oh, I can't control my own fate. I can't control over my own salvation. 
And I'll say, no, you can't. That's up to God. And they'll say, but, but oh, God, no, I'm not comfortable with God being in charge. I don't want him to be in control. Right. And we're going to say, but he's in control graciously to forgive you, to save you. It's awfully dicey. I'm not a big fan of that. And it's true. I mean, we're not a big fan of that. We want to have some say. We want to have some control over our ultimate fate. And we don't want God to be God over it. We want to, be, we want to have our vote, too. God's not a democracy kind of God. He's in charge. Great way to run a nation, not a good thing for God. So there it is. Uh, so what do you say to people that are baptized as babies and then they grow up and they Would want like, to be baptized again? Don't. Uh, <laughs> because it, it, if it's God's work, it worked the first time. But I stopped believing, and then I came back, which just proves the point. God didn't let go all that easy. You went away, but baptism remained. Now, what if you were baptized in a different faith? Uh, if you were baptized in a different faith, depends on what the faith is. Like, if you're baptized in the Catholic Church or in a... If you're baptized in a, tr a church that uh, is a Trinity church, a triune church, a Christian church, yeah, um, you're fine because it's God's work. You're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You've been committed to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you're baptized, say, in the Mormon Church or Jehovah's Witness Church, you weren't baptized in the triune name because they denied the Trinity. So it wasn't a real baptism. Um, it was water and some, some ceremony. It, was, it wasn't a baptism. So yeah, they would need to be rebaptized. Yeah. Okay, ready? Still going? Good. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Um, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. So, what does baptism do there? Brings us into what? One spirit. One body. It brings us into the one body. It unites us. One thing that levels the playing field among all of us is that we all must be baptized and we all have been baptized. There's no Christian who gets a special baptism, right? Uh, there's not some Christians who are baptized and some who aren't. We all receive Jesus that way. Same thing. Same with communion. It sort of levels the playing field, unites us. Galatians 3, 23 through 29. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. My heavens, what goes on there with baptism? What does it do? You who are baptized have been have done what to yourselves? Clothed in Christ. Clothed yourselves in Christ. Now this is a beautiful picture. When Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, what are they doing to cover up their shame and their sin? Clothed themselves. With what? Fig leaves. Fig leaves. Oh. Not real successful. <laughs> uh, and so God says, let me cover it up for you. And he sacrifices an animal, because that's where else you're going to get animal skins. And he makes clothes for them. He covers up their sin and their shame with the sacrifice. In baptism, you have been clothed with Christ. The sacrifice of Jesus has covered your sin and your shame, and that clothing has been given to you in baptism, so to speak. I like that picture. That you are heirs of the promise. I mean, this is all of the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ, and all of the promises are given to you here in baptism. Just an amazing text. All right, uh, we'll skip Ephesians 4, whoever had that one, sorry. It also says you're united. There's one hope, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God. Um, we'll skip Colossians 2 because, well, no, let's read Colossians 2, 8 through 15. See to it that no one takes you captive through hall and deceptive thoughts and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. 
In him you were also circumcised, in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And that might be my favorite text in the whole Bible. I love those verses. Uh, what does baptism do there? It what? It buries you with Christ. This is the Roman 6 stuff again. Buried with Christ, raised to a new life. But it's connected with circumcision. And now this is where the Calvinists actually are sort of part right. Uh, and, and sort of we get that in the other verses too. Where it unites you with the people of God. But here it's more than just unites you with the people of God. It not only gives you the mark of being united in the heart. It cuts off the sinful nature to use a very gross picture combining that with circumcision. Uh, your sinful nature has been cut off. You've been buried and raised to a new life in baptism. Make sense? Okay. Luther said, I just read this last night preparing for this, Luther says that he's not a fan of, of and I say this all the time and I'll probably continue to say it because I like the pic word picture, that baptism washes our sins away, Luther said it's, it's too weak of an illustration. Um, it kills us. The Bible illustration is it kills you and gives you new life. I mean, your sin isn't sort of just floating down the river. It's dead in the grave. And you are alive forever. I mean, it's really quite interesting. Last one. This is the big one. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. <clears throat> For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Lord of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, and is at, the right, at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Dude, okay. There are some people who will argue that we don't need water baptism, we need spirit baptism. And in the book of Acts, it's confusing. Were they baptized by water or baptized by the spirit? According to this text, what should it be? Water baptism, right? This water of Noah's Ark, the, the story of Noah, this water symbolized baptism. The water of the flood symbolized baptism. What did the water of the flood do to the earth? Washed away the sinners. Yeah, it washed away the sinners. And those who God chose to be saved were saved through water. And that now symbolizes what happens in baptism. Your old nature is killed and you were raised to a new life. Pretty amazing stuff. And baptism, and these are Peter's words, baptism now saves you. Not the washing of water, not because you took a bath but because baptism has united you to Jesus Christ. You can pledge a good conscience to Christ because the old nature has been drowned and you've been raised to a new life. So when Barbara saw her grandchild baptized this last week, she watched the child, this is going to be stark now, watched the child die and come back to life. Yes. That's the picture. <clears throat> Pretty amazing stuff. Um, this is the tough one. This is the one I was telling you about a few weeks ago. The pastor I really like, the Baptist pastor uh, online, he, he had a sermon on this text in Peter, and part of the title was, Baptism Does Not Save You. And it's like, well, geez, the text says the exact opposite. So we've got to go with what the text is. We can't read our theology into the text. We've got to take our theology out of the text. Uh, it's got to guide us, and this is what it says. Baptism saves you, and it saves you through the resurrection of Jesus. Pretty amazing stuff. 
bad. It, it just does. And then Titus 4, this is the last one. I'm sorry. Does someone have Titus 4, 3, 4 through 7? But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Okay. Now, we will say that this verse means, but it doesn't say the word baptism, but I don't know what else it would be talking about in reference to the washing of regeneration. I mean, unless it's being purely symbolic, but I don't think it is. It's talking about the washing of regeneration of baptism, in which case it's in the kindness of God that you have been baptized and been raised to a new life and justified in all of this. So Luther says, and this is what we finished, began with last week in the end of the Catechism, there is more here in baptism for us Christians to examine than we can ever possibly hope or imagine, so much that we might not even be able to believe it. Uh, and yet if we just go with what the texts are teaching us, Jesus is working all kinds of things in us through baptism. It's a whole new life we've been born into. Uh, it's a new way of living. And daily, we renew our baptism daily. Uh, one professor said, and I like this, every morning when I take a shower, now I don't take a shower every day, so it's not that helpful for me, uh, but every time I take a shower and the water hits my head, I'm reminded that I'm baptized. I'm a child of God. When you wake up in the morning, you splash yourself with water, and it reminds you, oh, I'm God's child today. My highs and lows, everything I'm going to go through, I'm doing it as a baptized child of God, as one who is justified, forgiven, and saved. It's pure gospel. And the, the problem I have when we ever we talk about this is we have to get into so much rhetoric and debate about it that we begin to miss the promises. Uh, you know, we're trying so hard to prove that here's, I, I did this today, trying to prove that the Lutheran view is right and the Bible is actually teaching this, that we begin to miss the promises that Jesus is making to us in baptism. You have been named by God. You have been chosen, justified, washed, killed, raised to a new life, forgiven, redeemed. Everything that God wants to accomplish for you in Christ is being given to you in baptism. It is an amazing, amazing gift. We can never talk too much about it. We can never think too much about it. So, hope that helped. Hope that was good today. Um, if you want a list of those texts, I can email them to you. They're here in my notes. Uh, there's more to be said, but that's, that's good for now. Um, uh, maybe next week what we'll do is we'll talk about the Lord's Supper. Uh, maybe we'll touch on infant baptism. I think we did that sufficiently today. But if you have more questions about that next week, please let me know. Uh, what do you want us to read? I don't know. The book. Uh, <laughs> read, uh, I think we want to talk a little bit about confession. I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, because we, we've done that when we talked about some other stuff. Uh, but let's do the Lord's Supper. So chapter 19, for sure. Uh, there's, a, there's like three chapters on the Lord's Supper. So Confession, we didn't, we didn't really even touch on. Well, we have, I think, in the past. So maybe what we'll do is this. We'll do chapter 19, and we'll talk about confession, and then, excuse me, chapter 18. Do 18 and 19 for next week. There we are. Chapter 18 and chapter 19. We'll start into the Lord's Supper after we talk about confession. And then uh, we'll, go, we'll do a few weeks on the Lord's Supper, which will be good for us. Okay? Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good week. Go to church. For more information on Faith Lutheran Church of Moore Park, California, and for more podcast episodes like this one, visit us on the web at www.faithmoorpark.com Music by Kevin McLeod.